So, uh, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the third webinar part of the webinar series, which is being organized by the Center for Arab Genomic Studies, or CAGS, with uh, support from the Ministry of Health and Prevention in Dubai, the Dubai Health Authority, and the Emirates Medical Association. This uh, particular webinar is sponsored by Gen Farm, so thank you very much to Gen Farm as well. Uh, excuse me. So my name is André Megarbani, and I'm professor of genetics uh, and department chair at the Lebanese American University in Lebanon. And I have been a member of the CAX uh, Arab Council for uh, 16 years. So before we start this webinar, I would like to take a few minutes to tell you a bit about uh, CAX. Uh, one of the main activity uh, of CAGS is uh, the biannual con conference, uh, the Pan-Arab Human Genetics Conference. Uh, we have had uh, till now eight uh, different editions and the upcoming one is actually scheduled for uh, December 2021. Other than this conference series, CAGS also organized workshops and courses, one of which was the MENA Mayo course in uh, 2019, which I was a part uh, of, along with uh, Professor Anthony Urtis Berea, uh, which will give us also a lecture tonight. Uh, CAGS also regularly publishes uh, clinical reports and review papers. In fact, we've been collaborating uh, for three years and we have already published 15 papers uh, together uh, with CAGS. Also, CAGS maintains a comprehensive public uh, access uh, genetic database. The CTGA, uh, which hosts uh, to date, uh, I believe, thousands of uh, disease genes and variant records from, the, uh, from Arab individuals. So I uh, really highly encourage you to check out and browse uh, CTGA. Uh, I'm using it uh, often when I uh, write some papers on uh, genetic disorders or orphan diseases in the Arab world. You can also uh, learn more about CACs in, and their different activities on their website and social media. So before we start, uh, if I can give you some uh, clues about uh, what we will do during this session. So any questions must be written in the Q&A box. Uh, please, question will only be answered during the Q&A panel discussion at the end of the, of, the, uh, of the entire session. So please stay till the end. CMA certificates can be downloaded as of uh, tomorrow. So like it's very fast for this. And you can link directly to the following link that is written here in red. Please uh, don't forget to answer the short survey at the end of this webinar. Uh, so the, I'm going to jump to the first speaker. Uh, the first speaker on this uh, during this session on gene therapy will be Denise Carbo, uh, Carbonaro Saracino. Uh, Denise works at the Orchid Therapeutics in the USA. Uh, Denise, Papers. Denise is the senior manager of medical affairs at Orchard uh, Therapeutics. She has great interest in the gene therapy of immune deficiency, uh, deficiencies, about which uh, she has given multiple talks in addition to gene therapy of mitochondrial diseases and lysosomal disorders. And as well, she has an interest in gene transfer using, uh, using viral vectors. Dr. Saracino will be talking uh, about gene therapy and overview. Uh, Denise, the floor is yours, or if I can say the Zoom system is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you also uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, shall I share my screen? It says that I cannot share at this moment. Yes, you can share it now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I've been asked to come to speak to you all about um, gene therapy. And so this is a presentation that's really a level set. It is designed to make sure that we're all starting from the same place in our understanding of gene therapies. It is not a product specific 
um, discussion. It's really just about gene therapy, gene transfer, the different modalities. So I hope um, this is for those of you who are more well informed, um, not too simple, but for those of you who are new to gene therapy, I hope it gives you a good understanding of, of what's involved. Um, so I'll be talking about the evolving gene therapy landscape, uh, the gene therapy paradigm. Uh, uh, Denise, little... have you have you shared your screen? Because we cannot yes. see your screen. Oh, you can't see anything? So no. sorry. No. Let me back up. Um, yeah. hmm. Tell me, do you see the full screen? Yes, we do. Okay. So yeah, I all the while I was flipping through these slides. Um, giving you an introduction. And, and again, um, this is really a level set uh, presentation. And th this, these are the topics I'll be going through, the evolving landscape, uh, a paradigm. I'd like to introduce the gene therapy paradigm for how we organize our thoughts around gene therapy. I'd like to go a little deeper into viral vectors and, and then some gene therapy applications. Um, so of course, as we know, there's a bewildering array of conditions that are being uh, approached by uh, gene therapy. And of course, we probably already know that there's a bewildering array, array of approaches uh, being used. And I think that is a really important tenet of understanding gene therapy is that there are many approaches, not one better than the other, but it is important to choose the best approach for the disease in which you're designing a gene therapy. Um, so let's start at the very beginning and really make clear that gene therapy really is the intentional alteration of a person's genetic code or gene expression profile with the goal of treating a disease. And in some cases, the disease may be by a known gene mutation, uh, such as in monogenic diseases, for which this group is probably well familiar. But of course, it could also be applied to those uh, diseases in which a gene mutation is not known, such as an acquired disease, such as cancer or HIV infection. And typically, gene therapies involve the delivery of a genetic element or tool that will alter a genetic element. Um, and so there are three real main broad uh, applications, and I'll just sort of go through them one by one. The first uh, group that I think most people are familiar with are what we call gene addition. I like to use the term gene augmentation because um, these are actually very different in my mind. Uh, gene addition would be where you're adding a gene that does not normally exist in the genome. And a very good example of this would be the CAR T therapies, in which you're adding a chimeric antigen receptor to normal T cells um, and asking them to do a job. That particular construct does not exist in the human genome. Gene augmentation, on the other hand, is where you're adding a functional gene that's depicted here on the left, and the gene that is not functioning remains within the genome, so you are augmenting the, the fun with a functional gene. Uh, it should be noted that in some cases, uh, the monogenic disease is caused by a protein um, that is not functional but is present. So it is important to remember that when we're doing gene augmentation, uh, we're adding a gene, but we may also be produ still producing a non-functional protein at the end. Uh, the other group of uh, main applications are those that are involved in, in uh, changing the transcriptome. And, and this would be where we would want to elicit gene silencing or gene suppression. So we'll be delivering an element that will do just that um, in order to ameliorate disease. Uh, these sequences will make some kind of complementary pairing and eliminate the uh, transcript or, or not allow a transcript to be formed to alter the transcriptome. And then I'm going to spend one slide only, maybe to some of your uh, disappointment, but really genome editing is, is another broad application, but it really deserves uh, a, a lot more time than we can devote here. But I do want to mention it because um, most of the major um, systems in place today used clinically and clinical development are still based on these guided nuclease delivery uh, tools. And this would include zinc finger nucleases, talons, and of course, CRISPR-Cas9, which uh, I'm sure most people are aware of their existence. Um, these nucleases create double-stranded DNA breaks and then they rely on endogenous DNA repair mechanisms uh, to repair in some fashion. When we're adding uh, a DNA donor because we wanna 
add a functional copy of a gene, then it, we will be relying on homologous directed repair uh, of that uh, cut. If we are looking to actually have suppression again, um, which is desirable in some cases, we would perform the cut and then rely on a more error prone process of non homologous end joining to repair the cut. Um, so, the, the, this technology at the moment with these double DNA, double stranded DNA cuts, um, is a little problematic in that there are some off cutting target, tar, off target cutting um, occurring. Uh, and a lot more work has been done since these were developed in that we're, they're now uh, developing these guided tools to not perform this cut. And so this field, I think, will eventually grow into something that is not involving a double-stranded DNA cut and, and will evolve. And that is already being seen with the base editors and prime editing. Um, so more to come in this area, but today we're gonna continue our focus more on the gene addition um, types of therapies. So when we're doing gene therapy, the main goal is to, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, is to choose really the most appropriate gene therapy system to achieve a desired therapeutic effect with the minimum amount of risk. Um, there is no single, gene therapy that's best for all applications. And basically we like to think of them as fit for purpose. And so when you're designing a gene therapy for a particular indication, it's important to consider several factors. First of all, it would be the disease state. Um, is this a monogenic disease? What approach would be best for that type of a disease? Or is it cancer? Um, so this is first and foremost on the list. Second would be what cell are we needing to uh, genetically modify? And this would be called the target cell, or perhaps it's a whole tissue or organ. Um, what type of genetic modification are we requiring? Again, is it gene addition, gene augmentation, gene silencing, and the mechanism of action that's likely required to ameliorate disease. Um, so are we looking to overexpress a protein or do we need physiologic expression? This would also really uh, go into our decision on the type of gene therapy. And, um, and lastly, how long do we want to have the desired durability of the therapeutic effect? And you can imagine with monogenic disease, you would like uh, a very durable effect or perhaps maybe with a cancer state, it does not need to be durable. So I'd like to introduce the gene therapy paradigm and it's simply really how to describe gene therapies in terms of their target cell, the payload that's being delivered, the vehicle by which the payload is being delivered and the modality of delivery. And simply these can be broken down very simply as the cells, the target cell being the cell to be modified. And, and this may be dependent on accessibility or the delivery method, but broadly they can be broken down into two types of populations, uh, homogeneous isolated cell populations, such as, uh, you know, of course, the one that comes to mind is a CD34 positive hematopoietic stem progenitor population that's isolated from patients' um, bone marrow or a heterogeneous population within a tissue, such as delivering uh, a gene therapy, say, to the liver. And an important thing about the target cell population, uh, it's important to remember that in some therapies, it may not actually be the therapeutic target. And again, a good example of this would be peripheral blood T cells that are expressing a CAR. Uh, they are designed, currently the approved products are designed to ameliorate B cell lymphomas. And so they are the target cell, they've been genetically modified, um, but the disease state, uh, is to really for them to go and um, eliminate those B cells. So it, it is something to consider. The payload uh, is mostly what people sometimes think of when they think of a drug product, they think of the payload as being the drug product. But of course we know that it's, it's a little bit more complicated to that. It's really the whole element, but it is really at the heart of gene therapy. What are we trying to do? what kind of uh, genetic modification. And it's usually, uh, this will lead to what the payload is. Um, and most often when we're doing gen um, genome, I'm sorry, excuse me, gene addition or augmentation, 
it would be something like a therapeutic gene, perhaps a cDNA, or perhaps a gene or part of a gene such as in beta globin. It could be a chimeric antigen receptor. Um, it could also be donor DNA for genome editing. So uh, this is also something to be considered or an mRNA. Um, it could also be one of these small interfering RNAs uh, if we're looking to perform repressor uh, activities or actually eliminate expression. It could also be a tool such as the genome editing nucleases. Um, so this again would be an example where you're modifying a cell um, and it may be its sole job is to deliver this gene editing nuclease. Um, and regulatory elements. Oftentimes when we deliver these payloads, they include some kind of method of regulating expression of that therapeutic payload. And then when we talk about delivery, we talk about vehicles or vector. Um, and typically in gene therapy, um, we, we use the term vector. And they, these broadly can be broken down into two categories, a uh, non-viral vector in which uh, we transfect some type of moiety or payload into uh, a cell by altering the chemistry or some property of the cell membrane for in entry. And a good example of these are uh, these uh, lipid nanoparticles, which share membrane characteristics uh, with cell membranes and which they can uh, basically fuse to the cell me membrane to gain entry and allow uh, diffusion of their payload into the cell. Another example would be electroporation in which a voltage is applied um, and transient pores open to allow entry of genetic material into a cell. And the, not, uh, and the viral vectors, um, we often use this term transduction uh, rather than infection because these are entities that are derived from viruses, but they are not actual viruses any longer. They share many of the properties of the virus from which they are derived, but they we, we use the term viral vectors. And in this, this scenario, the viral genes are typically removed, and this is where the um, payload would be inserted. And so the excision of the viral genome allows for the capacity. And this also renders these uh, entities to be non-pathogenic and usually replication defective. I won't say that all are replication defective. Um, it depends again on the disease state that's being approached. And then lastly, we want to talk about modality. And this refers to the location of genetic modification. It dictates which entities actually consider the drug product. So typically we think of two modalities, uh, ex vivo delivery and in vivo. Ex vivo would occur outside the body, so the target cell has been isolated and removed and put in a laboratory, um, is exposed to an agent in which there's genetic modification. In which case then, when the cells are returned to the patient, this is what is considered the drug product by the agencies. And in vivo delivery, the genetic modification occurs inside the body. Um, and it is usually the vector that is being somehow delivered into the body. And it is the vector then that is considered the drug product by the agencies um, in in vivo delivery. So now I'll we'll delve a little deeper into viral vectors. I mentioned that they are indeed engineered from a virus. And that means that they retain the behavior of that virus, um, in particular for the viral backbone. This is the area in which the viral genes have been removed and some kind of payload has been inserted. But it also, we should also mention that the behavior of this viral vector is also um, gained from what we call the pseudotype, because oftentimes, because we, we removed the outer covering of the virus, uh, we often exchange the viral covering from another related virus if we want to alter the types of cells that can be transduced with this viral vector. We call that altering the tropism, and these are often referred to as the pseudotypes. So it is important that the behavior comes from the virus in which the vir viral backbone is derived and from where the viral envelope or capsid is derived. Of course, these are non-replicating in general um, and non-pathogenic, um, but and they also retain some potential for immunogenicity, cytotoxicity, and genotoxicity. 
So these are the key features of viral vectors. And then again, of course, we want to break these down further into two broad categories. Um, and we like to think of these as those viral vectors that deliver an integrated payload versus an episomal payload. I will tell you right now that this is not always a black and white issue, meaning that not all viral vectors are one or the other. Usually they are some, uh, they do a little bit of both. Uh, but in general, when you have an integrated payload, this is a viral vector that will insert the genetic modification into the cell genome such that when the cell divides and the DNA is duplicated, the genetic modification is then passed on to all of the progeny. Whereas with an episomal payload, it does not integrate and therefore it is not duplicated upon cell division and it is just passed along um, to a few of the progeny. You can imagine if the cell is rapidly dividing or it's a tissue in which a cell rapidly divides, say such as blood cells, um, this episomal uh, construct would eventually be diluted and very hard to detect. It doesn't disappear, but it, it would be hard to detect. So now we'll, we'll just talk about the two most popular um, platforms that are being used for gene therapies, at least in, within the realm of approved products. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about AAV vectors. Um, this is a small uh, virus. AAV is uh, usually associated with uh, adenovirus because part of its life cycle requires help from another virus. Um, so that means that its viral genome is actually very simple um, and it, it can really all, it's actually simple and it's small. And, and basically this does limit its carrying capacity. Um, and so when it's rendered into a viral vector, we have insertion of a promoter and usually a gene of interest, some promoter to drive the expression of this gene. Um, in these particular viral particles, uh, the capsid is uh, often a pseudotype, if you will. Um, so the backbone usually is derived from AAV2, which is a serotype, a uh, type of AAV. Um, but oftentimes, uh, if the development of the viral vector requires entry into different cell types, such as neural tissues, uh, this would be uh, use a different gene from a different AAV, such as say AAV9 for neural tissues or AAV8 for liver. Um, and this way you could enhance the tropism and the ability of this cell to actually genetically modify different target cells. Um, this is a, uh, and it, this happens because these capsid um, proteins will actually gain entry through a receptor mediated mechanism. This uh, process of entering into the cell, into the cytoplasm, and then entering the nucleus and uncoding actually for AAV can actually take quite a while. Um, it could sometimes take a week uh, or more. But once it's in there, uh, the second, these are single-stranded DNA genomes. Um, so usually there's some form of second-strand DNA synthesis that occurs. And, and then oftentimes these uh, persist as episomes most of the time, and they are actually strings of virus uh, vector. So maybe just uh, one or more uh, concatamers of AV genomes um, being circularized. Uh, at least 1% will integrate into the genome. One of the behaviors of the wild type AV is to actually integrate into a specific site within the genome. So this is not a random, um, I want to say an unusual behavior of AV, but when it's done as a vector, it is usually not at that site and it is a more random um, insertion into the genome. Uh, more recently, it was shown that in dogs, this has uh, dogs with hemophilia have uh, retained uh, a lot of their expression because of these integrated genomes. Okay, so now I'll talk more about the integrating vectors. Um, so these are a group of vectors that are derived from viruses in the family Retroviridae, uh, which are the retroviruses. Um, it includes gamma retroviral vectors, lentiviral vectors, and fomiviral vectors. Uh, most commonly, we, most gene therapies have been approached with the gamma retroviral vectors, which are based on murine leukemia viruses, and lentiviral vectors, which are based on human Im immunodeficiency viruses. Excuse me. 
So basically, these have a single-stranded RNA genome that is reverse transcribed into double-stranded DNA um, that is subsequently integrated into the patient's cells. So when these viral vectors are produced, um, not only do they contain usually a, um, two copies of the RNA genome with um, some gene of interest or payload inserted into that place where the viral genes are, they also contain the proteins needed for reverse transcription. So it'll be a reverse transcriptase and for integration into the the target cell genome, and so that would be integrase. These are normally located within uh, the particle. And so they are ready uh, at the helm to enter into the nucleus and integrate the double-stranded DNA into the DNA, which then will be transcribed to produce the message and eventually be exported out into the cytoplasm for translation into a therapeutic protein. These two also gain entry into the cell through a receptor mediated mechanism, and oftentimes these are pseudotyped as well. Uh, gamma retroviral vectors are typically pseudotyped with a given apukemia virus to enter human cells, uh, and whereas the lentiviral vectors are typically pseudotyped with a vesicular stomatitis virus glycoprotein because uh, HIV is fairly restricted in the number of cells or the types of cells that it can enter using its endogenous envelope. So this uh, VSVG glycoprotein can enter most cells through the low density lipoprotein receptor, which most cells express. I'm often asked the differences between these two constructs. So I thought I'd go into it a little bit more deeply um, as I mentioned, this is a mouse leukemia virus. This is a human immunodeficiency virus. For human gene transfer, this is uh, a little less host cell restricted um, uh, compared to these gamma retroviral vectors. However, they are very similar in that they are both uh, single-stranded RNA genomes that are um, reverse transcribed into double-stranded DNA that will eventually be integrated into the target cell uh, chromosome. However, how they gain entry to the nuclear uh, compartment is very different. The gamma retroviral vectors have no ability to enter the nucleus until cell division occurs and there's dissolution of the cell nuclear membrane uh, during mitosis. The lentiviral vectors, uh, on the other hand, can gain entry through nuclear pores. So one of the main differences is that the gamma retroviral vector really needs to have a cell dividing in order to gain entry and full integration, whereas the lentiviral vector can enter through the nuclear pore and transduce both dividing and non-dividing cells. This is a key uh, difference, especially if you're looking to transduce stem cell populations. Uh, another big difference between these um, is that uh, these constructs are a little bit smaller and they're more simple, um, and they retain an intact viral enhancer promoter region that is quite strong and capable of transactivating um, areas of the genome when they do integrate into the target cell DNA. And so this is important. It's probably part of their uh, survival mechanism. In order to survive, uh, one mechanism would be to actually activate oncogenes, potential oncogenes, to immortalize basically a cell population to ensure survival of the virus, the wild type virus. Um, HIV, on the other hand, has a different, different mechanism for ensuring its survival. Um, one of the things I didn't mention about this particular vector is that it, unlike gamma retroviral vectors, which tend to all always integrate, lentiviral vectors do not always integrate. About 10% remain episomal. And this is probably what makes up the HIV reservoir. Um, and lenti, as you may know, means latent uh, in Latin. And it refers to that those latent um, episomal forms that might be used later on should integrated virus uh, be marked epigenetically for silencing, it would have part of the reservoir, um, some episomal genomes that could now be inserted into the host cell uh, genome. So the, again, this is where we talk about having a retention of behaviors. But I should mention that the most of the, almost 
universally, all the lentiviral vectors um, have been um, made a bit safer in that this viral enhancer promoter region has now been ablated. These vectors tolerate this deletion very well, whereas the gamma retroviral vectors less so. And so this ability to transactivate the cellular genome um, is, is basically ablated. With that, then we have to insert a cellular promoter to drive transgene expression. Um, but this gives us the ability to use uh, promoters that are maybe tissue specific or lineage specific, or maybe constitutive and provide overexpression. So again, once all of this occurs, um, regardless of what type of vector is, is uh, if you're talking about these integrating vectors, once the protein's made, the ability, what happens to this protein may differ depending on the disease state, the target cell, and, and what, how the construct has been engineered. So sometimes the protein will remain in the cell. Sometimes it will be, uh, because it's being overexpressed, it may be secreted out into the surrounding area. So it is available for cross-correction. Um, and other times uh, you may actually have this protein just acting locally where either substrates move in. Um, a good example of this is ADA deficiency where this protein would be ADA um, where uh, it's metabolic purine salvage uh, enzyme uh, substrates would move into the cell to be broken down. So there are different mechanisms of action um, depending on how the construct is engineered. So I just wanna spend a little bit of time talking about hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy um, because I think this is a very powerful platform. Um, this is a stem cell population. And again, if you're using a viral vector and it is a viral vector that will integrate, uh, you can correct this stem cell. It will correct other stem cells that sell for new. And then of course, this population of cells will go on to make all of the differentiated blood cells and all of these blood cells now will have actually the same genetic modification. And this is very powerful because now all of a sudden you can either correct blood diseases that involve the immune system or hemoglobinopathies, um, but you can also approach other disease states um, such as the central nervous system or basically any tissue in which you're going to have cells that are um, tissue macrophages and grafting. So this could be the liver, the uh, nervous system, kidney, uh, any tissue that is going to uh, have a resident macrophage population might also benefit from these cells being genetically modified. And I think I'm at my last slide here. Um, and so I just want to end with this last example of how these, this type of therapy of when you're um, genetically modifying hematopoietic stem cells, um, they are removed from the patient and then they're transduced, they go back in, but there is this segment of cells that might actually track to the CNFs. Um, it is thought that these macrophages or monocyte derived macrophages will um, track to the CNFs and will provide for um, secretion of a needed protein here shown on the left um, as they engraft as microglial-like cells. But an additional component of, of this type of therapy, typically these cells will not engraft into the bone marrow very well or into other tissues without some type of conditioning. Of course, there are risks involved with the conditioning, but there are some beneficial consequences. We believe that especially for the CNS, that the, some of the dysfunctional microglial cells may be removed um, with this type of therapy. Um, so it is more complicated than just curing blood diseases when you're using this platform. So this is just an example of, of how an integrating vector would be used to transduce a very rapidly dividing cell population. And just to sort of wrap it up from where I started, you can imagine that using an AV um, that persists episomally would not be appropriate for something that is dividing quickly and repopulating. So again, it's about choosing your gene therapies for what's appropriate and for what you want to achieve. And with that, I will end um, just with a quick summary um, that gene therapy approaches our medicines that modify the genetic material in a person's cell 
to treat a specific disease pathology. Uh, the approaches are diverse and they're basically fit for purpose. And they typically consist of a target cell population, a payload, a delivery vehicle, with some type of uh, delivery being specified as in vivo or ex vivo. Um, the viral vectors that are currently used are derived from viruses and broadly classified as integrating and non-integrating. AV are best for those transducing those cells as slowly dividing and retroviral vectors such as gamma retroviral vectors and lentiviral vectors are best for rapidly dividing cells. And HSC gene therapy can be used to ameliorate several disease types simply because the genetically modified blood cell progeny can enter and graft in many tissues. So thank you for your attention um, and I will wait to answer questions at the end. Thank you very, very much, Denise, for this very clear uh, presentation, introduction. And now I'm going to uh, give the, I'm going to call the, the next speaker, Dr. Isabel Richard. Uh, Dr. Uh, Isabel is an expert in neuromuscular diseases. Uh, she's currently heading the muscular dystrophy team at Geneton in, in France. She has published more than uh, 170 scientific publications on genetics of uh, muscular dystrophies. Uh, uh, also, she worked on the identification of pathophysiological mechanisms of uh, the diseases, identification also of biomarkers, and she worked on gene therapy. She's also involved in translating different gene therapies for limb garter muscular dystrophy into the clinics. She is a co-founder of the biotech company Atamio Therapeutics. Uh, her title for this uh, session will be on innovative therapies in neuromuscular uh, disorders from the scientist's perspective. Thank you very much and welcome uh, Dr. Isabel Richard. Yes, thank you so much for this kind introduction. In fact, I, I, I have a... Uh, um, the system is telling me that I cannot uh, switch on my camera. So because of the, um, so I don't know if you can switch, uh, give me the, the possibility to switch. I will uh, anyway share with my, my, share my screen already. Uh, okay, now I think it's okay. No, yes, it's okay. So I'm going to share. Um, okay. And full screen. Okay, so um, did, you, did you see the, the, the thing on, on the, did you see the presenter or? Yes, yes, we can see your presentation. <laughs> okay, okay, so, um, so we are going to, to uh, enter now um, more application and especially of gene therapy, especially for neuromuscular disorder. So I'm, I, I yeah, I'm, uh, just I wanted to say that uh, I'm a researcher working in, in uh, Geneton, which is a lab created by an association in myopathy. Uh, and the objective is really to develop uh, gene therapy for rare diseases, uh, which is located in France. And, uh, and especially regarding the, the, the rare disease, we are working ourselves in the field of neuromuscular disorders. So I have a slide here to show you uh, the extent of, uh, um, of this uh, Type of diseases that can affect both the uh, the, the brain, uh, the spinal cord, of the uh, neuromuscular junction of the muscle, and all these diseases, of course, uh, in, impact uh, uh, heavily the uh, quality of life, and they're also associated with a uh, number of morbidity le leading to uh, and can lead to early death. So now the the um, the field in moving toward the treatment of this uh, different uh, type of disease for gene therapy. And especially you will see after my talk, the talk of, uh, of uh, Andoni ortiz or, or showing you how this field has advanced to the clinical application and especially for uh, spinomuscular atrophy here, uh, some uh, 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 dystrophy as well and, 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 and muscle disorders. So we are ourselves in the lab interested in, in muscular dystrophy. And, um, um, and uh, in this particular field, in fact, the, the virus of choice and the, uh, for uh, delivering the gene therapy is, uh, as Denise presented, uh, AV uh, uh, um, uh, vector. 
So I'm not going to go over everything because uh, uh, the point uh, Denise already presented uh, uh, a lot, this is effective. Uh, just to highlight that uh, uh, the disease is very simple. It is composed of a uh, protein shell, composed of uh, 60 different uh, proteins that are coming from uh, normally the, 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 the genome in the, in the rep, uh, thanks to the expression of uh, cap gene here and the genome inside. And, uh, um, and when you derive uh, a vector from these uh, uh, diseases, you have in fact, uh, what you want to achieve is the highest efficiency and the highest safety possible. And these two elements are mostly defined by where the virus is going and um, how and where also uh, the, uh, the, the gene is expressed in the body. Um, so I will go a little about uh, over these two elements. So first, the, the tropism of the vector, which is defined by the capsids. So you have different, so the protein shell, you have different serotypes, so different form of this AV that I have indicated here. So these are the most frequent, frequently used uh, AV in the gene therapy field. Um, uh, but there are uh, a lot of the, um, additional AV that have been identified. And also uh, something very interesting is that you can engineer the cassette to modify the tropism, so to modify where the, the virus will go in the body. Uh, I show you just an example of uh, the last one, which is AV9. And this one uh, has a particular affinity to the liver, uh, to the heart, also to the skeletal muscle and the brain. So this capsid is very well used for diseases affecting these different uh, um, uh, organs, and especially uh, the brain and the skeletal muscle, in fact. So it's very, uh, uh, and, and so where the, the, the virus uh, goes, it will define the safety, the efficacy, of, of course, because you want to target the, the, the tissues that you, um, that you want to treat, but also the, the, the safety, because if you have a too much uh, vector load in one organ, you can have a, a, an immune reaction or, and I, I will go again over that. It's very important this, uh, this, uh, this for the safety and as well for the, uh, for the cost of gene therapy, because if you have a, um, a very efficient vector for targeting the tissue of interest, you can reduce the vector load and the vector that you are administrating to the patient. So it's very important to define precisely the best capsid or to engineer the capsid according to your need. The second element for uh, the efficiency and the safety is driven by uh, the genome. And Denise presented that you have a promoter, you have your target gene. In fact, for the AV, you have two possibility of inserting a gene and this is represented here. And the promoter or the other regulatory element of the, cas of the cassette will in fact indicate uh, uh, where the, um, the transgene will be expressed and at which level it will ex be expressed. And this also can, uh, of, of course, will define the, uh, uh, the efficacy because you want really your transgene expressed at the correct level in the correct tissue. But we'll also define the safety because if you have an ectopic expression outside, you may, this may lead to the, uh, a toxicity if the, the protein that you're expressing is not wanted to this particular tissue. I just show you here on, on the right an example of the comparison of the expression of um, an AV vector with two different promoters, one in black and one in, in, in in, uh, in blue, showing their differential expression across organs. So the, you can really uh, select uh, your promoter according to your need. And uh, as I said, this really define the, the safety and the efficacy. There are a number of uh, challenges uh, um, regarding the, um, uh, the gene therapy for neuromuscular disorder uh, in the uh, muscle diseases, because uh, skeletal muscle represents 40% of the body mass, you need a large quantity of AV. Of course, so this has a manufacturing issue. Uh, in the case of the neurological diseases, uh, there is a, a, 
uh, a barrier due to the accessibility of the uh, of the school and also the blood brain barrier. One thing also is that uh, you have um, to treat, and this has been shown in SMA, that you need to, um, uh, it, it would be better to treat as soon as possible to, uh, to, to be able to have a full reversibility of the tissue uh, of, the, um, of, of the disease, in fact, and, and, and to, uh, to avoid uh, facing the irreversibility due to tissue, too much to see damage. Uh, another element is that the, the AV uh, has a small capacity of encapsidation, so you, don't, you cannot put a large gene in it, and this uh, is a uh, um, prevent, in fact, the direct use of the full-length uh, cDNA in a number of diseases, uh, especially in muscular dystrophy of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and also another one, muscular dystrophy, which is tetinopathy. Uh, another element is that uh, a lot of people have already been uh, in contact with AV, so they are seropositive, and so existing neutralizing antibody can uh, prevent a patient to enter a, a clinical trial. And uh, of course, in these diseases, so usually the, the, the evolution is uh, uh, slow. So it's, um, you need to define precisely the criteria that you're going to use to say uh, that your, uh, your uh, job is efficient. Um, so these are the different challenges. There are also a, a number, and, and I think uh, Andoni will come back to this, that have been uh, seen already um, as the consequences of uh, high doses of AV used in the clinic. Uh, you have, uh, in some cases, with very high dose, all these are correspond to very high doses. And this, uh, this, the defining this also help to, um, to, to, to be able to, to, to improve uh, the different uh, strategy of, of gene therapy. So the, uh, you have, I highly listed the different things that have already been seen in a clinic regarding the transfer of AV. And again, uh, uh, with high dose and uh, and this uh, new generation will try to, a vector will try to avoid all these uh, different uh, possible, possible uh, toxicity. Um, and uh, uh, there are a number of uh, strategies, and I already talked about that uh, a little, that could prevent the deleterious effect. You can engineer the, cap the capsid, you can uh, have a selection of, uh, rest of, the, uh, of a, a specific promoter. And then regarding the uh, uh, pre-existing antibody, there are a number of strategies and, and more and more researchers are working on that to define uh, a strategy that will allow re-injection of the vector. Also with AV, we have a long lasting effect that uh, spend more um, their observation with more than one decade of, of efficiency. Um, oh, it's not moving. Yes, yes. Now I, I will I will more enter more into a detail and and in the past of going from uh, uh, the first demonstration of that the gene therapy could be efficient and this is done in animal to what to for where we um, the the um, uh, toward the clinical trial so there are different steps that you need to to uh, to, to go through. There are a lot of things at the technical level, so all the things that are uh, defined for demonstrating the efficiency and the safety. So you have a first demonstration, then usually we optimize to define the best product to go to the human. We have a dose study to define the dose, precisely the dose that is required to have a, an efficiency that we, 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 we plan to have in human. And you need to have a, a, a regulatory toxicity study. So this is mandatory. Uh, to, to define the, the safety of your product. They are a, to, a, a step of uh, development of the process to produce and to, um, and to qualify your product. And then you have everything at the clinical level, or, which can include natural history and preparation of the clinical trial. So you have to go through all these steps to, from the initial demonstration to the clinical trial. And I will show you now a, a, a quickly and um, because of the time, they, they, uh, a demonstration in, uh, at the technical legal level that we have done in the lab. So this is about a, uh, a muscular dystrophy, which is one of the topics that we are very interested in. And uh, um, so the muscular dystrophy are genetic diseases that are characterized by a degeneration of the muscle. 
and this leads to a reduction of the motor function of the patient. And uh, uh, just to note that uh, there are already clinical trials with AV in this uh, field of muscular dystrophy, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and another uh, disease called Limgaller muscular dystrophy. And I think Anthony will come back to the, to, the, to the Duchenne muscular dystrophy later on. But today I want to just to show an example of another muscular dystrophy, um, which is a FKRP deficiency. In the case of Duchenne, uh, in fact, the, 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 the cause of the, uh, of the disease at the genetic level is deficiency in uh, dystrophin. The protein is here. And there is a number of different proteins that are associated with this, uh, with this protein, that, and we, we call that the dystrophin-associated complex. And uh, there are a number of, of structural proteins, but uh, there are also a... Um, uh, and directly protein that participate in the generation of this complex by modification of uh, at enzymatic level. And I, today I would like specifically sp uh, speak about FKRP, which is a protein that participate in the uh, secondary or the post translational modification of another protein, which is alpha dystroglycan here. So alpha dystroglycan is a very important protein at the surface of muscle fibers, and through this. Uh, this um, modification in form of glycosylation, it can interact with different partner and the extracellular matrix. And in the muscle, it's laminin, and this in fact anchors the fibers to its environment. And this anchoring will protect the fibers to uh, contraction induced damage. So when you don't have uh, this glycosylation, the, the fibers uh, become fragile and you have degeneration. So the, the protein of interest today participate in this generation of this glycosylation. Um, okay, we'll skip this one because of the time. And, um, and just to, to tell you that the, the genetic deficiency in FKRP can uh, um, um, affect different tissue, the brain, the muscle, and the retina. And this leads to a number of diseases that are indicated here, where the most severe is Walker-Warburg syndrome, which is very severe, but uh, not frequent. And the most frequent, but less severe is LGMB. For none of these diseases are its treatment so far, so we wanted to develop a gene therapy product for them. So we have a generatic NAV, and it is depicted here. We have the human form of uh, the FKP uh, uh, cDNA. We have a muscle promoter. Um, and in fact, what we did is um, to first to do a first demonstration in the first model that reproduced the most frequent mutation in the patient. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the model was not very severe, so we have to create another one to go to push forward the, the program. And this highlights, in fact, the crucial point of selecting a correct animal model for your, your, pro for your project. Mm -hmm. So we have developed another uh, mouse model, which is much more, uh, um, uh, which is a muscle specific knockout, and it is much more severe. Um, and it's represented here, in fact. Uh, this was this was a muscle of our first model, and this is a muscle of our second model. And um, as you can see, that it's much the muscle is more degenerated. So what we did is uh, we we injected our vector in such model at different doses to define the dose effect relationship. And this is what we see. So we we when we do this type of experiment, you measure first the entry of the vector in your tissue. And you can measure by the, the copy number of the virus. And this is shown here. And you see that we have a dose effect, meaning that you have an increase of the, of the presence of the vector according to the dose, A and this in different muscle and also in different organs. So this is just an entry that is defined by the tropism of our vector. Then you look at the expression of the transgene. You look in here, you have a, a dose effect also of the transgene expression. You see that. We, we see expression at the messenger level of our uh, transgene at the different doses. And this also, we, do, we see a dose effect at the level of the protein. The more we have of the vector, the more we have of the protein. Uh, this is a, the, the, the effect showing that after uh, gene transfer, we have correction of the glycosylation I told you about initially. And this is detected by this uh, uh, green Green bar. We have a Western lot here detecting the glycosylation. And you see that in our model, we have a decrease. And then after gene transfer, we have a restoration. So we have really restored the activity that is needed for the muscle to function. And then at the, at the level of, of, um, of the tissue, 
you uh, you can see that here we have the tumor cell of our model, and after gene transfer, we have a nice correction and and and, and beautiful muscle. So another this was in the skeletal muscle, and we have also the diaphragm where we reduce a lot of fibrosis tissue compared to to, to the origin of the, to the model, and then this translates to say. Uh, this improvement also translates at the level of the, the force of uh, the animal. So we have different means to measure to measure the force. We can measure the force in uh, the um, isolated muscle. We take the muscle and measure the force. And you can see here we have our model that decreases the force. And after gene transfer here, we have restoration of, of, of the force of the muscle. And we can do also restoration uh, uh, an analysis of the expression of the force in the living mice. And you can see that uh, we, here we have a dose effect of the restoration of the, of the force. So this, we have a dose here that define all the parameters. And this is in fact the, the, the way you are, uh, um, an example of preclinical pre that are used to define the dose that you're going to use in a clinic. So to summarize, because I think it's time for me, <laughs> To summarize, uh, I show you that uh, in this um, in this particular case, we have a dose-dependent gene transfer uh, and uh, of the vector. We have a dose-dependent uh, expression of the transgene. We correct the uh, the, the, the defect of uh, the protein. We improve the histology. We improve the force. And we also I can uh, highlight I did not present it, but we have not observed any immune responses against the transgene. And now with this data, um, we are moving to the preparation of the clinical trial with all the different steps that I, I presented before to so the preparation of um, the, the, the development of the process uh, for preparing the clinical trial uh, of the, the clinical product. And this has been done. The, clinic, the, 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 the clinical product is, uh, is batch is prepared and we are really uh, preparing um, uh, the clinical trial that should happen um, in the next day, uh, coming months. Okay, I am going to stop that. And also like uh, Denise, I will be ready to take uh, any question after the, the talk of Anthony. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Isabel, for this uh, very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, I think that uh, the best thing to do it will be to uh, wait for the of the lecture of Andoni, uh, Professor Andoni, Jean Andoni Ortiz Berea is uh, certified both in pediatrics and uh, physical medicine and uh, rehabilitation. Uh, he served as medical director at the uh, IFM, the French Association, Association Against Myopathies, and then as the general delegate of the Institute of uh, Biology in Paris. Over the past 20 years, he headed various worldwide events related uh, to myology. Uh, he currently serves as a consultant for several pharma companies. And uh, I will say most of all, uh, Andoni is a great friend. And to put the cherry on the top of the cake, uh, together we co-founded the Maladie Orphelines en Frontière, MOSF, to the NGO dedicated to humanitarian relief for people of rare diseases. And Andoni uh, is a great friend to all the Arab region and to all the world. I will say he travels a lot to see a lot of patients. And he will talk about his experience and he will give us a lecture on innovative therapies in neuromuscular disorders, but from the clinician's perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Andoni. Hi, shukran tir, uh, Andre, for this very nice introduction. Maharabat to everyone, welcome. Uh, I can't share, yes, I can share now. Uh, so as uh, mentioned by the previous speakers, now we're going to talk about the clinical applications of gene therapy in the neuromuscular uh, field. And for that, I've selected for you uh, just uh, three examples, and I will focus uh, mainly on gene replacement therapy. Okay, um, so these are my disclosures. So I'm basically a clinician, but quite involved and interested in neuromuscular uh, disorders. Um, uh, just uh, a word of caution. Um, you remember what um, 
uh, Isabel said about the, the, the diversity of uh, neuromuscular conditions, and it's true, we're facing like 500 different diseases. Um, but based on this classification, you should keep in mind that, for instance, some uh, neuromuscular conditions uh, may uh, uh, result from defects in the anterior horn cell disease, okay? M meaning that it's part of the CNS here, the central nervous system, whereas the, the other big group of uh, uh, neuromuscular conditions is uh, located in the muscle fiber itself. So in terms of strategy, it may also uh, impact uh, what you're going to do uh, regarding uh, gene therapy. So today we are going to show three examples. Okay, one about uh, spinal muscular atrophy, um, another one about Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and another one about uh, myotubular myopathy. Okay, one is, as I said, a motor neuron disease located here. Uh, the second one is a muscular dystrophy, and the third one is a congenital myopathy. So let's start with spinal muscular atrophy. Um, I guess that many of you uh, know the, the disease because it's, it's pretty common, especially in the MENA region in the Middle East and, 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 and around. Uh, it's an autosomal recessive disorder. Um, the incidence is, is one in 6,000 to 10,000 live births. Uh, there are many heterozygotes in the general population and even more in consanguineous areas. Um, and we used to divide uh, this uh, condition into at least three different types, type one, type two, and type three. And uh, the, the vast majority of patients are actually type one patients. That is the most severe forms of uh, SMA. And just to give you an idea about the magnitude of the problem in, in, uh, in France, which is a 65 million uh, population, uh, we roughly diagnose 100 new cases yearly. And we have uh, approximately 1,200 people living with SMA uh, daily, okay? So again, the, the, the phenotype that is how the disease manifests is, is for a clinician, for a, a child neurologist, easy to recognize in general uh, when we have, for instance, those very floppy, not babies generally, because at birth they are okay, but after some time, uh, before nine, um, before um, age three month, they will demonstrate uh, severe floppiness, uh, breathing difficulties, swallowing difficulties, and most of them uh, will not survive beyond two years of age. Okay, so that's type one. So they will never sit, they will never walk, uh, and they will uh, almost die uh, uh, very prematurely. Type two patients are called sitters because even though they will never walk, they've achieved at least some degree of motor improvement, of motor uh, milestones, uh, and they may survive quite long if you pr uh, provide them with uh, proper uh, care. And type three patients are by definition patients who have achieved independent ambulation, so they've been able to walk at least for some time, and they may or may not uh, uh, lose ambulation uh, on the long run. Um, we can categorize these patients according to the age of onset, as I mentioned it, uh, as the maximum motor function achieved by the child. Uh, we could also incorporate other uh, markers or other parameters to define the prognosis of, such, of every kid. And for that, we use a, a SMN2 copy number, which is a good, um, a good biomarker that I will explain to you in a, in a moment. But keep in mind that the bulk of the SMA population in most countries is type one SMA patients. That is again, the most severe form of the disease. So we know a lot of things about the pathophysiology of this disease. Uh, there are two genes, they're almost identical. There's only one uh, single nucleotide difference here, which uh, uh, disturbs the uh, splicing machinery. And whereas in the, the original uh, SMN1 gene, I mean, the, the one, the, the particular gene that is producing the full length uh, protein necessary uh, for uh, motor neuron disease uh, uh, survival. In the SMN2 gene is unable to do that because it, it, it lacks uh, exon 7 in the messenger RNA and therefore the uh, full length protein here in, in green is, is just limited. It's, it's about 10% uh, 
of, of the production. So once you have a, a homozygous deletion of SMN1, which is by definition uh, a spinal muscular atrophy, then you're lacking uh, SMN. And SMN2 is just compensating to some extent this, this lack of uh, SMN protein. And that's why most strategies so far have uh, focused on the, the, the need to re-express or to enhance the expression of the SMN2, uh, this SMN protein via this MN2 uh, gene. So um, it's true that we are facing nowadays a, a therapeutic revolution in SMA. Um, it's unprecedented. Um, we have three drugs now approved for uh, uh, by both uh, uh, FDA and EMA. Um, the first strategy is about oligo, um, I'm sorry, antisense oligonucleotides uh, called nusinersen and designed by Biogen. Uh, we have this gene therapy we're going to talk about. We have another small molecule which also acts on splicing machinery designed by uh, the Roche company. And the first two sh are really showing dramatic impacts on survival of type 1 uh, SMA patients. And at this point, uh, we already uh, use Spinraza more for type 1 and type 2 patients. Zolgensmer, which is the gene therapy product, more, is a more appropriate for type 1 and perhaps type 2. Well, the, the last one is probably more effective uh, in type 2 and type 3. Um, so again, just to, to remind you that most most strategies, therapeutic strategies, focused so far on the uh, increase of the SMN protein, either by replacing the gene itself or by uh, play, uh, playing on the splicing machinery. But uh, in the more or less distant future, we might also use other SMN independent strategies like protecting the motor neuron or um, putting in a muscle activator to uh, uh, rescue the phenotype. So all this is very exciting and very promising. But today we're going to talk about the gene replacement therapy that has been approved not long ago. That's the name of the, 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 the gene, the, the drug, sorry. That's the Onasemnogene Abuparovic. And the brand name is Zolgensmat. It's been designed by Avexis originally, but Avexis has been uh, taken up by uh, uh, Novartis. Um, so we use an AV, okay, that's the uh, AV with a uh, serotype 9. Um, the, the biggest advantage of this uh, particular virus is that it crosses the blood ban brain barrier and therefore it, it enables us to target neurons, which is uh, again unprecedented. It is supposedly non integrating, non pathogenic. And you have, and it's clinically uh, meaningful. I mean, you have a rapid sustained SMN expression and therefore you will prevent those metanurons to die. And uh, it's supposed to, to remain stable within the nucleus for years, as we will uh, discuss later on. So that's how it works. But Denise and, and Isabel has, has shown that uh, very nicely. Uh, but from a clinical viewpoint, it's remember, it's a unique intravenous infusion. Okay, it's a single shot uh, therapy, and and in that in that sense, it, it is very good for for patients and for uh, clinicians alike. So the vector is incorporated in the target cell, as we can see here on the diagram. Uh, the, the 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 therapeutic DNA enters the nucleus, it forms an episome, uh, and then the, the the mRNA is transcribed and 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 produce the 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 SMN protein. Okay, that's how it works, and it works perfectly. Um, and with that, you expect to have a sustained SMN thesis uh, for, for many years, okay? At this point, we don't know how long it's gonna last, perhaps 10 years or more or less, we don't know. This would be uh, meaningful at the, the clinical level. So there's some degree of uncertainty about that. So the, 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 the work started uh, seven years ago in, in the USA with uh, Jerry Mendel here. It's the, the, the pioneer for gene therapy in SMA. So he dosed uh, nine children to start with and then extended to another six um, uh, patients. Um, it was a dose escalation study. Um, the safety, efficacy, everything was studied and was positive. Okay, so no toxicity at all. 
good clinical outcome. So that was it. And it started to be a, a real success story. Um, these are just the scientific evidence showing that at the clinical level, and for that we use the Charpington score, which is an, a motor uh, ability score uh, used in infants. We clearly showed that uh, children, instead of dying after age 20 months or so, were still alive and still improving at the motor uh, level. So that was great news. And that's why uh, that has been uh, advertised worldwide, uh, saying it was, it was a major breakthrough uh, in gene therapy first and also in SMA. So this child um, was having, was she was a, supposedly a type one patient, I mean, type one SMA patient with two uh, copies of SMN2, so a classical one, but now look, she's able to, to walk, to run and, and develop like any other kid. But keep in mind that she has been treated very, very early and we'll come back to that. Um, again, from a clinical viewpoint, how does it work? Well, there are prerequisites. You need to know everything about the molecular genetics in your patient. The, it's, to be sure, it's an SMA patient. Uh, you need to measure the SMN2 copy number. You need to look for the presence or absence of uh, the anti uh, AV9 antibodies. And uh, you will initiate a steroid therapy uh, to prevent uh, uh, adverse effects. And uh, you will dose the child in a hospital setting. You will monitor this child for quite uh, some time, at least two days, if not more, and you, you really scrutinize any trouble, okay? Uh, clinically, fever, vomiting are red flags. Uh, the rays of uh, transaminases or uh, platelets drop or proteinuria are also red flags. So you have to be cautious. It's a, still a, a new therapy, even though it's been approved. Um, and you also need to, to continue the steroid therapy for at least uh, uh, one month. So that's where we are now. So as I said, Novartis um, took uh, up uh, the biotech called uh, Avexis. So far, 300 children uh, have been exclusively infants, have been exposed to Zolgensma, the uh, onasemnogene abupervec, um, as opposed, for instance, or compared to the 11,000 children with SMA exposed to nusinersen. Uh, so it's just give you an, an ID. And, and again, the, the, the safety profile in general is, is pretty good, but but we, we're facing a few uh, serious side effects, uh, such as the thrombotic microangiopathy, TMA, which is treatable to some extent, uh, but sometimes uh, this complication can be lethal. And, and we had one uh, very sad case in, in France uh, just recently. So we have, again, to be uh, cautious in our indications of this gene therapy. So we are now considering combination therapies that is using either uh, oligos or uh, the small molecule as, a, as, as something, as an add-on to the gene therapy. Um, the other issue we have, um, not in France that much, but uh, in many countries, the, uh, the problem of accessibility, okay, because this is a very costly drug. It costs approximately $2 million just for one shot. And uh, despite a compassionate program by uh, Novartis, uh, we're still uh, lacking this drug in, in the vast majority of countries, okay, and people especially parents cannot afford such such a cost. And therefore you really need to have a good uh, healthcare uh, system with uh, good insurance to, to, to perform this uh, medication. Um, just one word about the French experience. Um, to date, uh, we dosed 28 children, 28 infants. They improved in most cases, um, most patients do not need a ventilator as they did in the, in the natural history. Um, and we even had a, in a very impressive case of normal development in a girl that was treated presymptomatically because uh, her brother was affected. So when she was born, she was diagnosed very early as, as a potential SMA patient and therefore treated in the first uh, few weeks. Uh, so that one is really doing very, very well. Um, again, the, the safety profile we observed in our French cohort was good, except those two deaths, uh, one due to lack of efficacy uh, and the other one due to this uh, serious effect, uh, side effect that I mentioned earlier on. And we hope we, we're sort of 
lucky in France in the sense that uh, um, all SMA patients, type one patients, I must say, has potentially access to, to, to this uh, gene therapy product, which is not the case in many other countries, okay? So money in France at least is not an issue at all. But uh, ethics is an issue and the decision made by parents is also is an issue um, because uh, in our last statistics, um, we noticed that approximately half of uh, parents uh, whose child is having SMA type one uh, decline the uh, treatment, okay? So they, they don't want to have, uh, or they don't want to face any risk or any trouble with the kid. And therefore they, they're not ready to embark on any uh, innovative therapy such as uh, gene therapy, for instance. Okay, so the, the, the example of SMA told us that if we intervene early, then we are likely to have a, a much better outcome. And that's the reason why now uh, newborn screening programs are just mushrooming everywhere in the world. I'm just um, uh, showing you that what's happening in the US where most states now are having SMA on the list of uh, uh, genetic diseases to be screened at birth. And it's good news because you will be able to detect these cases quite early and to treat them immediately. In the rest of the world, uh, and this uh, slide is a bit outdated, it's coming. Uh, not much in the Middle East, but still, I think there's some initiatives in, in uh, Saudi Arabia that I heard of, uh, and it would be very relevant in the uh, Middle East context, because as we know, the consanguinity here is high, and the rate and the prevalence of SMA is very much higher than in, in Europe or in the rest of the world. The second um, example I would like to give, it's, it's not a success story, or it was a success story at the beginning. That's myotubular myopathy. Um, this is a next linked, um, sorry. Um, uh, it's a next linked disease. Let's go back to it, sorry. Yes, so, um, okay. Oh, 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 sorry, I'll be back. So the myotubular myopathy is it's an extremely rare uh, neuromuscular condition. It's congenital, um, only boys are affected and uh, the vast majority of kids uh, die before uh, age two years and a few survives into the teens. Um, this is just to give you an example of how they look like when they survive. And I say, as I said, it's not the majority of them, uh, okay. Um, so we know the gene, okay, it's on chromosome XQ28. It's a rather small gene, so we can sort of uh, package it uh, easily in a virus. Uh, we know the protein, we know the pathophysiology, we have an animal model for that, and uh, therefore gene therapy was tried in this uh, uh, mice and was the proof of concept that we can really make a huge difference first in the mice. As you can see here, these mice, uh, these knockout knock out mice uh, survive uh, and they have a, a normalization of their body weight. Uh, so further on, they shown that in dogs in, with the myotubular myopathy, it, it was also very successful. And then we decided to embark on a clinical trial uh, with the a company called Odentis. And that was four years back. Okay, so this is the design of the trial. Um, and it was using an AV uh, uh, type eight. Okay, so it's different from AV9. Um, and it showed in, in, in humans, I mean, in patients, a dramatic improvement uh, uh, at all levels, including motor levels, but also at the respiratory levels. Uh, many of them uh, were weaned from their ventilator. They, were, they became ventilator free. That was an excellent news for them and for their parents. So we were quite happy. And uh, uh, even at the uh, histological uh, level, we showed that we were able to rescue the phenotype. In other words, that the, the, the myotubes were disappearing and that the normal muscle was, was back again. So that was good news. And in terms of safety, originally, everything was fine, okay? But um, what happened is that uh, just a few months ago, um, there was a clinical hold by FDA, that is the regulator, because um, they were uh, three kids who, who died, who passed away after dosing. Uh, 
most probably due to liver failure and most probably related to an excessive uh, viral load. Okay, so we had to go back to to uh, to bench, I would say, and to to, to look at the the data. Um, so we observed a six months, more or less uh, six months observation uh, period during which uh, there were no other fatal cases uh, reported. And therefore, FDA uh, said, okay, now you can go uh, um, and, and move ahead. And but most probably there will be revisions in the in the clinical protocol. So that's a good example of saying, okay, that was almost a success story, but we have been halted by safety concerns, okay? The, the point is that they probably used uh, um, the, 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 the viral load used was probably uh, high, okay? I don't know whether it's shown somewhere, but anyway, that, that's one question we have in mind that potentially the, the dose used was really, really too high. Okay, I will skip that. Now, the last example, um, and it's not yet a success story. It might be a success story. It's Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So you, many of you heard about this disease. It's a devastating disease uh, affecting uh, only uh, boys. It's been described, described years ago. And nowadays we, we have some drugs, but um, the, the clinical outcome is, is uh, limited, I'd say. Uh, we're using exon skipping strategy or a stub codon read through. Um, some of these drugs have been approved. Uh, but in terms of gene therapy, it's another story. We'll see that. So the disease is very um, devastating, as I said. It's, it's very common in the sense that it's the most common form of muscular dystrophy in childhood. Uh, we know about the pathophysiology again. It's a dystrophin deficiency. It, go, it results in a continuous decline in global functioning, both in the muscle, but also probably uh, in the brain uh, and in other uh, places. So that's the national history. All this has been very well documented. And again, what we tried, and I will focus now on the AAV uh, approach uh, using a micro a mini dystrophin. Why using a micro a mini dystrophin? What's that? Actually, the, the DMD gene is real big. Okay, it's 79 exons as shown here. Uh, and it's, it's a long messenger RNA uh, or the cDNA is, is huge. And, and it's a fact, very difficult, very challenging to put all this entire gene into virus. That's why uh, some researchers uh, designed a small version of the dystrophin, which are still functional, okay, but they're reduced in size. And um, using that trick, they can insert this, uh, this micro, this uh, reduced version of the dystrophin within an AV. So we've seen that and we've done that, uh, for instance, in, in, in a canine uh, model like uh, the, the Duchenne or the DMD dog, I would say, the golden retriever harboring the disease, and it works perfectly. And they, you are able to re-express the dystrophin, the micro dystrophin within the muscle and, and this. So just recently, and that dates back uh, to, to a couple of uh, months or years, but uh, we have now four, at least four companies involved in the field. Uh, Solid Biosense uh, designed its own uh, trial with 16 kids um, starting uh, four years ago. They had, again, some stop and go by FDA regarding safety. Um, the second company involved is Sarepta. Uh, with this particular uh, program. Um, so all these clinical trials are rather, uh, let's say, uh, cautious in the sense that it's a phase one, phase two uh, trials. Um, they're using um, pretty high uh, dose of uh, viral when of AV. Um, they're usually non-randomized in the beginning, but after that, they need a phase three trial to show that the, the product is really efficient. Uh, keep in mind, again, that it's a one single shot, uh, and that's good news in a sense. Uh, but the, the bad news is that you can't re-inject, obviously, because the child is immunized against the AV. Uh, so the original uh, uh, trial, the Pavitol trial, was, was uh, uh, exciting and, and promising. The second one as well. Uh, but in January this year, uh, in this uh, phase two trial, the clinical outcome was a little bit uh, disappointing, and that's why uh, they have to revise the, the clinical protocol. Anyway, that's the Pfizer program. And again, it's a limited number of kids being dosed that way, 
but it's uh, it's also looking promising. Uh, it's not a micro dystrophin here, but a mini dystrophin, which is a, a, a bit larger version. Uh, and they are uh, uh, having also some serious effects uh, uh, with the the immune response to the to the vector. So. And I will not, these are the, the clinical trials in the pipeline. And, my, and to finish, Janeton uh, has its own program, which has been uh, uh, designed recently. And the, the, the first patient has been dosed just a few days ago. And uh, it's an, again, an AV vector with microdystrophy in one single ejection. And we plan to inject at least 14 DND boys. Okay, so, um, the, this is more or less the final uh, slide. I mean, there are many pending questions in this uh, mini micro and mini dystrophin uh, clinical programs. Um, as I said, the transgene we're using is not a full length TMT gene. It, so therefore we don't know what's gonna happen in terms of uh, protein and, 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 and therefore in terms of uh, clinical outcome. Uh, it's still a question. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it goes. We're still confident, uh, but we have to be, again, very, very uh, cautious in terms of uh, safety, okay? So the take home message for you, uh, as you see, they are, and it's, and it's still r true. I mean, uh, having a therapeutic revolution using gene therapy, uh, we, we are probably uh, going to face uh, great achievements, but sometimes disappointments. We should be ready for that. And we have to explain this to parents, for sure. Safety is still a concern in many of these clinical trials. Uh, I, I s highlight as well the importance of early diagnosis and screening, like newborn screening or uh, many other uh, screening programs. Uh, and uh, in France, uh, when we discuss this um, innovative therapies, uh, either because they are approved or just because we need to, to have a clinical trial, it's always done collectively, okay? We have a steering committee at the nation uh, le national level, and we discuss case by case um, what we should do, what should be proposed to the family for this. And ethical issues are really, really a growing concern. And as I mentioned, especially for adult and SMAM in the, the gene therapy for SMA, that accessibility is, is a, a growing uh, problem. Okay, I think I'm done. So I'm thank you, Shokran Tir, for your attention to all of you. I'm not sharing my screen and I'm giving back the floor to André. Thank you very much, Andoni, uh, for the also great lectures. We had uh, three fantastic uh, topics on gene therapy. Uh, we have, I guess, uh, five to 10 minutes maximum. Uh, what I will do right now, which is I will try to do, um, ask uh, questions for the three of you and one of the questions is about the ethics. I think that you talked about a little bit on the list so what can we do for the countries, uh, the poor countries, to uh, get them the access uh, to those uh, you know, medications, uh, knowing that in most of those poor countries, uh, those are the, the pro probably the countries that helped to discover the different genes in uh, myopathy at the end, but they, unfortunately, they won't be able to access uh, to, um, those medications. So, uh, very, very quickly, any answers? I think your comment is quite relevant. I mean, Andre, and the fact that we sort of um, exploited <laughs> some countries in a sense, and then nowadays there's no feedback uh, um, and the return on investment is low. Uh, but I must say that we, uh, a number of people are just concerned by that and are trying their best to 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 make things change and um, even within Novartis and other companies um, we're trying to organize this compassionate use of these drugs okay so I know it's difficult it will be limited in terms of, of numbers but we, we're still having for instance in Tunisia recently and there's been a kid uh, SMA kid dosed with the gene therapy product, okay? So it's it's visible. Uh, and the, the other point is that I guess that in the near future with competition, um, the prices will definitely go down, okay? To which extent, I don't know, but uh, there will be some uh, some sort of uh, 
better accessibility. But you're right, we have to fight for that. Parents have to fight. Uh, you, we have to lobby governments as well to convince them. We even have to go to court. Uh, it's happened uh, very often in some countries in Russia. But okay, but it's gonna it's gonna happen. It will it will come. Thank you. And the question for Denise and Isabel. I, uh, the questions are: What about uh, episomes? Can Philip quickly talk about episomes? And also, I'm going to give you all the questions at the same moment. Uh, so what they were asking about episomes, about the vectors. If you have specific vectors that might go to the brain. Uh, directly to the brain, and how do you choose your vectors to go directly to the specific? And uh, if somebody is also immunized, for example, using the adenovirus uh, vectors, if somebody has already got uh, the, uh, an infection by the adenovirus, is he uh, also will be able to uh, be helped or treated with those vectors? Hi, uh, I'll take the question about the episomes. Um, the, yes, and I'm, I apologize for not being clear. Um, a lot of times when these uh, species are, enter the cell, these constructs, uh, whether it's a lentiviral vector or an AAV vector, um, they are more stable in a circular form. And oftentimes they can exist as linear forms um, but oftentimes they do form circles. Um, but in general, whether we're talking about a circle or a linear form, episomal just usually means outside of the genome. Um, so that is what an episome is. I saw that question pop up. Um, hopefully that answers that question. And about the vectors also, can we, do we have specific vectors to, that might be able to go to the brain barrier to? Faster the print value, Isabel or Denise? I think Isabel uh, had a very nice slide that kind of indicated, showed all the different serotypes um, and going to different tissues. She kind of focused more on AV9, but AV9 is known to, to go more to the neural tissue. Uh, I have direct experience with AV8, and I can tell you it is definitely has high tropism for cardiac tissue, skeletal mus muscle. Uh, so it's actually muscle. Um, I, I think I, when I started working with AAB8, I thought it was going to go to the liver, but it just was like muscle. <laughs> so they definitely do have specific tropisms and it's because of the receptors uh, by which these serotypes gain access. So um, AAB8 may be designed by, by evolution to enter more of uh, mus muscular tissue. Um, likewise, there are a number of capsids that are being generated in a type of in vitro evolution, if you will, trying to develop different capsids that will enter different um, tissues more efficiently. And I'll stop there and let Isabel carry on. Yes, Denise, Denise is uh, totally right. And uh, there are um, um, a, a very large number of study for which um, the people are trying to develop new capsids with a specific property and especially uh, crossing the brain blood barrier. Uh, three weeks ago, there was a, a, a meeting of the Association American Society of uh, Gene Therapy. And um, there, are, there are several of them that were reported and they, 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 they showed that uh, it's possible to cross a brain uh, um, the blood brain barrier by designing new uh, capsid and modifying the, the tropism by adding uh, different elements at the surface of them. Yeah, so it's possible. And it's also to say the case for additional tissue, the, the tissues that are not uh, yet transducible. So more and more, we will be able to design a, a specific AV that will go exactly where we want uh, them to go. Uh, a question for both of you, Isabel and uh, Denise. Uh, how do you measure the potency and efficacy of vector in your present models? How about if I just take the, um, I see that question. Um, how about if I just talk about um, in, in um, a next vivo context and I'll let Isabel talk about in, in vivo. Um, so for HSC gene therapy, this is actually a really 
interesting question because a lot of times people measure gene vector um, with some type of quantitative PCR technique um, that will detect those sequences within the integrated genome. So the DNA is extracted from a variety of cell populations, typically peripheral blood, because that's really what we can take from patients. Um, it's hard to access other tissues. Um, but actually we get a lot of information from looking at peripheral blood. There are two components, main components. One are the peripheral, mononucleos, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, your leukocytes, if you will, uh, the lymphocytes populations. And these uh, tell us really how those cells are accumulating in the periphery. So those uh, cells that are being generated from the hematopoietic stem cells that have been grafted. And so you'll see accumulation over time with those cell populations as those differentiated cell populations uh, expand. With the granulocyte fraction, because they are renewed every three days, um, we actually do get a window as to what the current level of engrafted corrected cells are within the bone marrow niche, because anything that's arising in the, in the granulocyte fraction would be fairly new. So we use that as a surrogate for engraftment. Um, and again, using looking for vector sequences uh, by qPCR. Yes, regarding the, the in vivo, I can uh, um, uh, 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 illustrate this uh, regarding the neuromuscular field. Though. Um, when you have in a patient, you have the possibility to take biopsy of, of the muscle, for example. And from this biopsy, you will also measure the, um, uh, the presence of your vector, the expression uh, with the same techniques, which the PCR or RT-PCR of expression of the protein by Western blood, things like that. And if, um, and ultimately you also look at the, at the histology like uh, I presented for the animal model. And then you will look also at the different uh, criteria, the function level, meaning the force of the patients, uh, uh, the capacity to, to perform set, uh, certain uh, ac action. And in the case of you, you in, in the case where you cannot do biopsy, you have uh, uh, mostly to resort on the efficiency of your treatment. So um, uh, we say uh, all judicial outcome measure in patients. Thank you. I will take uh, two more questions. One uh, for Anthony or for any one of you. And one of the tricky questions, so the first one will be, uh, we know that the SMA in therapy costs around $2 million. Uh, so how does this compare with the current costs for the management in this case in the absence of therapy? Hello. Um, yeah, I think I can take the question. Um, there have been a, a, a number of studies trying to show that uh, this kind of innovative, very costly uh, and, and, um, medications would be a relief for healthcare systems um, because those kids, the, the, the untreated kids either die early or because they are very disabled. But I must say that at this point, it is still debated, okay? So we, we need more time. We need more kids to be dosed. We need to see the impact on their daily life. I must say that apart from those treated very early, which will develop normally, we'll have, and probably a, 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 it will be a growing concern, a number of kids uh, very disabled I and mean, still very disabled. They may not be type one, they will be transformed into type two. And those type two patients will still cost a lot in terms of uh, healthcare and, and all of that stuff. So it's not at this point a, a question which is uh, totally resolved. Thank you, Anthony. And the last one, uh, probably for also Isabel and Denis. How can I synthesize a protein with neurons via gene therapy? Could you repeat the question, Andre? Because... How can I synthesize a protein, you know, but we, when, when we know that the neurons usually does not, you know, multiply one, so it and uh, uh, how do you think that uh, size? Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe I can start to, and uh, if you want to complement that. Uh, in fact, uh, here you have, you want to target the specific uh, cells uh, that, uh, so you, you, 
you need to have first a vector that will go there. So you have, as I said before, a, a, a number of uh, of capsids uh, of AV capsids that can that have been engineered to go there. And then you, the second determinant is uh, where that you have the capacity to produce a protein, and this will be defined by the promoter. So in that case, if you want to have an expression in a neuron, you need to have a, a, speci a neuron-specific promoter. I, th I think there was also a, a question about repeating, I mean, um, such gene therapies, and I think and it's a question to you, uh, Denise and and uh, and uh, Isabel. Um, the, the duration of the the gene expression within the cell. Um, okay, we're talking about eight years, ten years. We don't know. What, what do we have? Like, uh, do we have further evidence of, of that, or is this still a pending question? Um, I I can take a stab at at just. Um, Saying this again is where you really need to look at what is appropriate for your disease model, right? So whether you're treating something that needs uh, long-term expression or not. And I, I guess I, I really should have taken a step back and really focused in on, on how fast the cell, the target cell population is dividing. Uh, AAV, even though it's not integrating, if it's going into being delivered to post-mitotic tissues or tissues that are not uh, in dividing very quickly, then it, is, it, it may actually persist for quite a while um, where that wouldn't be appropriate for a blood cell population where there's constant division. So I think it just depends on, on that, but you're quite right. The data are not there um, for re-administration. And I'll, I'll let Lizabel take, take over from here. Okay. The, the, the... Um, but you have a question of long term and the question of re-administration. So so far, I think the the uh, we are fifteen uh, fifteen years of uh, of feedback for gene therapy, something like that. Um, uh, persistence in human, and um, so it's very few examples so far, and we're getting uh, and and if it decrease over time, there, there will be the question of re-administration. And that um, is, in fact, there are many uh, groups working on that to, to design a different strategy. So you, you can remove the neutralizing antibody from the blood by plasmaphoresis. For example, you have a, a different a, a regiment of immunosuppression that can help on that. And also, um, uh, there are a number of different studies that uh, of, of different techniques that are being developed that will in fact directly uh, um, suppress in vivo the antibody against the capsid against the AV. But there are many many different research going on on there, and I think we we will see uh, we will see more in the future. Thank you very much for all the three. Uh fantastic, awesome speakers. Unfortunately, we have to end up this uh, webinar, this session on uh, gene therapy. Uh, so I uh, urge you also to give your feedback of, uh, on gene therapy. But don't forget that you can download your certificate starting tomorrow on this uh, link. And the next webinar will be on uh, big data in genomics uh, on June 30th. And we thank you very much once again. Thank you for tags uh, and for Jim from all the answers. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for attending and bye bye. And it was great. More, more, more than 450 attendees. Thank you. It was very success, uh, successful. Thanks uh, to the three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Bye -bye. Me too. Thank you, Stephanie, also, and all the CAGS team. Thanks.
Yeah, thank you to the organizers for making sure everything went smoothly. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.